Welcome everyone, good afternoon. Welcome to Brain Awareness Week 2022 and UBC's Neuroethics Distinguished Public Lecture. It's really a pleasure to have all of you with us this afternoon for a 90 minute discussion with one of the leaders in our field who will speak about ensuring equitable access to advances in brain health, a topic that is deeply important to, to us here in Neuroethics Canada, at UBC, and to institutions, I believe, Canada-wide. Um, let me acknowledge, please, that we are gathered today on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, um, and as we gather, nearly 100 of us who are joining this lecture today from territories from near and far UBC, I would like to acknowledge the original peoples of all the lands on which we work and on which we thrive. We are always indebted to the supporters of these events for Brain Awareness Week when we really have the opportunity to engage with you, the public, our colleagues, our trainees, our researchers and collaborators around the world. Um, Neuroethics Canada is host to this event. We thank deeply the Dana Foundation and all of the Brain Awareness Weeks that occur um, globally during these important days. We thank the W. Maurice Young Center for Applied Ethics at UBC. We're grateful to the Javad Mohajan Center for Brain Health at UBC. And we thank also the Vancouver Functional Neurosurgery Division of Neurosurgery at UBC and Vancouver Coastal Health Research Institute. The next 90 minutes, minutes or so will be broken down in the following way. Um, we'll hear from Dr. Patrick McDonald, who I'll have the pleasure of introducing in just a moment, who will speak for about 45 minutes. Uh, he and I will then have a bit of a dialogue around some questions that we find are particularly important around his topic of interest. And then we invite you, the audience, into a Q&A with us that I will moderate. The meeting and chat box will be recorded for posting and archiving. So please um, note that whatever you put in the chat is will be as uh, recorded as much as the audio. Um, you will be muted upon entry. Um, we ask that you raise your hand uh, uh, for the Q&A portion. You can click participants raise hand button on the bottom right of your screen. And Marianne Bakani, who we thank for organizing these marvelous events will be there to uh, assist and uh, we'll bring questions through the chat box or the Q&A and I will help to monitor those. Um, we also wanna note that we have a big social media presence, presence and we invite you to connect with us on Twitter and Facebook and Neuroethics BC and our event hashtags are Brain Week and Neuroethics. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Patrick McDonald. He is the head of the section of neurosurgery at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg and an associate professor in the Department of Surgery at both the University of Manitoba and the University of British Columbia. Dr. McDonald was born, raised, and trained in Toronto, obtaining his medical degree and pursuing neuro neurosurgical training at the University of Toronto. After a fellowship as chief clinical fellow in neurosurgery at the hospital for sick children, he obtained a master's degree from the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. In fact, I think he's one of two neurosurgeons in Canada who formally holds a degree in bioethics. In 2016, he relocated to Vancouver to be the head of neurosurgery at BC Children's Hospital and to hold a faculty position here with us at Neuroethics Canada. He has recently returned to Winnipeg as chair of the section of neurosurgery, at the University of Manitoba, but retains his association as faculty with us at Neuroethics Canada. Dr. McDonald is chair of the ethics committee of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the past president of the Canadian Neurological Neurosurgical Society. His research focuses on ethical issues in the adoption of innovative neurosurgical procedures especially neurotechnologies and outcomes in pediatric epilepsy and hydrocephalus. Dr. McDonald, it is a pleasure to welcome you back to beautiful British Columbia, where it is much warmer than it is in Winnipeg, where it's been somewhere between minus 30 and minus 40 for the past several months. Uh, we're always um, 
We're so happy to have you here and very honored to have you give this um, UBC Distinguished Neuro e Neuroethics Lecture for us this year. So please, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Judy, for the kind words. I think there's a rumor that it might go above freezing in Winnipeg this weekend. So uh, it's spring is near. So I'm going to talk about uh, a subject that um, has always been of interest to me and, and I try to um, weave into my practice, and that's ensuring that we provide equitable access to treatment uh, within Canada. And as you'll see during the talk, ways that we may be able to extend that, not just to Canada, but around the world to low and middle income countries. I'm gonna start um, by acknowledging that, although I'm in Vancouver right now, I came from Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, which is Treaty One territory and home of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Lakota, Dene uh, nations, as well as the home of the Red River Métis. And we're always striving to improve uh, our relationships with those communities and recognize that it's a privilege to work on those ancestral lands. Some of the work that I do has been funded by the National Institutes of Health and the University of Manitoba. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'll be talking about, I'll briefly talk about how I got here. How does a neurosurgeon uh, also do neuroethics research? And for those of you who aren't familiar with neuroethics, a very brief introduction to what it means. And then I'll talk about equitable access to the tremendous advances that we've had over the past couple of decades in the treatment of brain illness and use pediatric epilepsy, drug resistant pediatric epilepsy uh, as a lens to do that, both within Canada and throughout the world. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge uh, the mentors that I've had throughout my career. The gentleman on the upper left is Mark Bernstein. He's a neurosurgeon in Toronto who trained me and is the first neurosurgeon to have an advanced degree in bioethics, one of two, as Judy pointed out. In the middle is Peter Singer, who was the director of the Joint Centre for Bioethics in Toronto when, my, when I did my master's degree and took a chance on a raw, naive neurosurgery resident uh, to undertake in his master's program. And finally, uh, Professor Illis, uh, who was one of the reasons that I relocated to Vancouver, was the opportunity to work with her, who has been a tremendous mentor, colleague, and friend. And I would not be where I am today without all three of these people. So we can talk a little bit about what is neuroethics. So broadly speaking, it's the ethics of neuroscience, the ethical decision-making we make when we care for people with brain illness. And to a lesser extent, the neuroscience of ethics, what is it about our brains that allows us to make ethical decisions? The field is relatively young. It's celebrating its 20th anniversary in 2002. And Professor Illis is one of the founders of neuroethics at a conference called Mapping the Field back in 2002. And I like her definition of neuroethics, which is that it's concerned with the ethical, legal, and social policy implications of neuroscience and neuroscience research. And I would add to that the ethical implications of the care that we provide to patients with neurologic illness. So is this any different from bioethics in general? And I think the answer to that is yes. Our brains are so integral to our notions of who we are, to our notions of the self, agency, and responsibility. And it's imperative that we ensure that these advances that have been undertaken in the last decades are equitably provided to those who benefit, who will benefit from it, not just those who can afford it. One of the unique things about neuroethics is that it's anticipatory. So we try to find, to seek out what might be the ethical minefields when we're developing a new technology rather than react to problems as they arise. And I think as this talk is a good example of, from the beginning, beginnings of the field, it placed a strong emphasis, emphasis on public discourse and training of uh, people in neuroethics. I think the thing that got me um, most interested about equitable, equitable access to care was some time that I spent, I had the privilege of spending in Kenya in a small missionary town called Kijabi, which is about two hours northwest of Nairobi, the capital. And I worked there with a pediatric neurosurgeon named Leland Albright, who's pictured here along with his wife, Susan Furon, who's a nurse practitioner. 
And Dr. Albright relocated to Kenya after a long and very productive career in pediatric neurosurgery in the United States and worked for about five years in Kajabi. And during that time, uh, invited a number of pediatric neurosurgeons from across North America to come out and relieve him to some extent because he was the only pediatric neurosurgeon in all of Kenya and actually did more work in five years than he did in his 35 year career in the United States, did more operations in those short period of time. One of the first cases I did in Kenya, uh, I'm showing you the MRI of the patient here, was an 11 year old girl with epilepsy who showed up to the clinic having had seizures and had seen a number of doctors who prescribed seizure medications for her, but she was still having the seizures. And we were able to obtain an MRI in her and showed this abnormality in her frontal lobe. Um, when we took it out and sent it to the lab for analysis, it turned out to be tuberculosis, something called a tuberculoma. And when I debriefed at the end of the day with Dr. Albright, as we did at the end of every day, he said to me, TB in the brain, I bet you've never seen that before. What he, and it was a reasonable thing for him to say, if you look at the incidence of tuberculosis in Kenya, it's about 230 cases per 100,000 people per year. Canada has one of the lowest rates of TB with six cases per 100,000 people per year. But what Dr. Albright didn't know is that I came from Manitoba. And so Manitoba, if you look at the map here, like most parts of Canada, about 80 or 90% of the population lives within about an hour and a half of the US border. The remaining population spread out over a vast geographic different distance. Manitoba also, or Winnipeg Children's Hospital, also is responsible for the care of people from the Kivalik region of Inuit. So a relatively small population, only about 10,000 people, but spread out over a huge geographic distance. And while the incidence of TB in Canada is only six cases per 100,000, if you look a little more closely, you'll see that in the indigenous population, it's 21.5, so almost four times as common in the indigenous population. And in the Inuit population, it almost equals the incidence of tuberculosis in Canada. So when Dr. Albright asked me, I bet, or said to me, I bet you've never seen that before. In fact, I'd seen it a lot. And for me, this uh, struck a number of things about the inequity in healthcare and um, just inequity in general, in that both throughout the world, we see tremendous inequity, but even within Canada, one of the richest nations in the world, we have tremendous inequity based on where you live and where you grow up. So this has kind of act as a spark or a catalyst for uh, one of the things that I study along with Dr. Illis, and that's um, drug-resistant epilepsy and how the provision of care for drug-resistant epilepsy varies so tremendously, both within Canada and around the world. And that's what I'll talk about today. Although I'm gonna talk specifically about epilepsy, you can apply this to many other neurologic illnesses. The story will be the same. So we define drug-resistant epilepsy as someone who's continuing to have seizures despite being tried on two different anti-seizure medications. And it might be more common than you think. About 1% of Canadians have epilepsy and about a third of those will have drug resistant epilepsy. So their seizures won't be controlled despite being on medications. That accounts for about 300,000 Canadians with epilepsy and 90,000 with drug resistant epilepsy. If you look across North America in children, about a half a million children have epilepsy. So it's a fairly common thing and one of the more common things that a pediatric neurosurgeon and a pediatric neurologist would treat. I'm gonna use the case of a nine-year-old girl with epilepsy to highlight the advances we've made in the treatment of epilepsy, many of which are neurotechnology based and the work we still have to do in ensuring that those benefits are equitably distributed. So this case is a nine-year-old girl with epilepsy who was initially well controlled on a single medication but was now having about 20 or 30 seizures a day, despite being on three different anti-seizure medications. And although most of her seizures were focal, meaning they just involved twitching of one part of her body, increasingly they were starting to spread so that she was losing consciousness when she was having her seizures. And that can become a life-threatening problem. The workup for drug-resistant epilepsy is very involved and very technology-driven even under the best circumstances in the most highly resourced settings, it takes quite a bit of time to work someone up with drug-resistant epilepsy. 
But we start with some basics. We get what's called an EEG or an electroencephalogram that looks at electrical activity in the brain and can sometimes tell you exactly where a seizure is coming from. We'll also image the brain. And one of the big advances in diagnosing epilepsy and coming up with better treatments for it is the advances we've had in brain imaging. Before MRI, we often didn't see many things that were causing seizures. And even now, as our MR technologies improve, we're seeing things with higher field magnets that we never saw in the traditional one or one and a half Tesla magnet that most hospitals have. And this is an, ex an example of what you might see in a three Tesla magnet, an abnormality here in the frontal lobe that turns out to be something called cortical dysplasia, which is a very common cause of epilepsy. And if you remove this part of the brain, there's a reasonably good chance, about a 70 or 80% chance that you'll stop seizures in someone. But you have to know that that abnormality is there before you can treat it. We also admit patients to what's called an epilepsy monitoring unit for v video EEG monitoring. This is continuous electroencephalography. So this is an example where we'll bring someone into hospital and actually stop their anti-seizure medications. This is a circumstance where we want them to have seizures so we can better delineate where the seizure is coming from to see if we can figure out what the best treatment for their epilepsy is. Sometimes that leads to what's called invasive monitor. So what I showed you in an epilepsy monitoring unit are EEG electrodes that go on the surface of your scalp. But sometimes that doesn't give us enough information and we need to go on with more invasive monitoring. And traditionally up until probably the last five or 10 years, we used what are called grids and strips. So that involved a very lar large operation where we temporarily removed part of the skull. And as you see in this picture of the brain, this or a series of grids that we place on the surface of the brain, and sometimes smaller strips, and sometimes depth electrodes that we place deeper in the brain. And then we close everything up and send that child back to the epilepsy monitoring unit. And again, we, this is a circumstance where we want them to have seizures so we can find out exactly where the seizures coming, are coming from, and if possible, remove that part of the brain. The way we um, invasively monitor monitor seizures has changed dramatically over the last five or 10 years, as I alluded to. And we've moved from these very large grids and strips where patients are very sick after the surgery, headaches, vomiting, uh, and sometimes we have to bring them back to the operating room urgently because they're having um, complications of that, of those grids and strips. We've moved to still invasive, but less invasive monitoring through something called depth electrodes that we use very sophisticated robots to um, place these electrodes. And so this is a picture of the epilepsy surgery team at BC Children's Hospital uh, in 2019 when we first got our robot. And this really was a paradigm shift in how we uh, diagnose epilepsy in children and in adults for that matter. And so this is a X-ray of the skull that shows you all of the different depth electrodes that have come in. And that might look quite gruesome, but it's like night and day for these children. Instead of a child who's sick, vomiting, really bad headaches because we put these very large grids and strips on, these kids could actually go home. Um, they look like they've never been through anything other than the fact that they have a large dressing on their head. And I think there may come a time when we actually do send these kids home for that monitoring. Sometimes we'll keep them in hospital for upwards of two weeks while we try to delineate exactly where their seizures are coming from. And this is a picture of myself and my colleague Mandeep Tambor here in Vancouver. Um, doing one of those procedures. Other things that are used to work up drug-resistant epilepsy are very expensive. All of this is quite expensive um, techniques, a variation of EEG called magnetoencephalography. We put all of these patients through quite rigorous neuropsychological testing, uh, as well as functional MRI imaging. And that helps us um, figure out where whether or not their epilepsy focus is close to a what we call an eloquent part of the brain, a part of the brain that's responsible for speech or motor function. Once we have all this information, the ideal scenario, this is an example where you actually want your MRI to be abnormal. If you're having seizures and we have an abnormality that we can see on your brain, then that makes it actually quite easy to treat with an operation where we remove that focus of, of seizures or that abnormality in the brain. So the most common surgical operations uh, to resect the brain are a temporal lobectomy, lobectomy where we remove most of your temporal lobe, which is a very common focus for epilepsy. Uh, 
The picture on the right shows an example of a patient after they've had a portion of their temporal lobe removed. And sometimes we do even more um, invasive procedures where we actually disconnect one half of the brain from the other. That's a fairly extreme operation, but it can have a dramatic result in a child who's having 50, 70, even 100 seizures a day and stop their seizures altogether. We look at neurotechnologies and there've been tremendous advances in the treatment of epilepsy based on the development of technologies. Some have been around for quite a while and some are relatively new. So vagal nerve stimulation is a procedure where we place an electrode on your vagus nerve, which runs in your neck and hook it up to a generator that then stimulates the vagus nerve. And about half the patients we put these stimulators in, we can improve their epilepsy. We can cut down their seizures by 50% or more. There are newer procedures uh, that are slightly more invasive, but a little more sophisticated. And the one that I think holds much promise, but is not yet available in Canada, is something called responsive neurostimulation. And I think of this, any of you who have uh, fam fam family members who have a uh, pacemaker, it's almost like a pacemaker for the brain in the sense that it will record a seizure or be able to detect a seizure before it starts and then stimulate the brain such that you never have a seizure. Deep brain stimulation, which is a procedure used primarily for adults who have movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, is now playing an increasing role in the treatment of epilepsy, both in children and adults. And I think this will be something that we'll see will play a larger and larger role over time. All of these things are expensive, come with significant cost and significant commitment from the patient and their family. A newer treatment, again, that uh, was actually invented in Canada, in Winnipeg of all places, is something called laser interstitial thermal therapy. And in those patients where we can find a focus of epilepsy, we pass, uh, again, using that robot that I showed you, a very thin, small laser probe that then heats up and destroys the tissue where the epileptic focus is. So that's a, a less invasive or minimally invasive way to treat seizures. And this has really taken off over the last five or 10 years, such that um, more and more patients, children and adults are having their epilepsy treated this way for properly selected patients. And the final technology that I'll talk about that has only been used a handful of times in epilepsy is focused ultrasound. It has the advantage of not being invasive in the sense that there's no incision involved. Uh, there's nothing passed into the brain. It uses external ultrasound waves to target a lesion in the brain. And similar to the laser destroying the tissue where the focus is, this using ultrasound waves can destroy an epileptic focus. And although it hasn't been used much, I predict that it will be used more and more commonly because it is probably the least invasive way we have of treating it with relatively few side effects. So if we go back to our nine-year-old girl that I presented earlier who has drug-resistant epilepsy, I wanna take you on that child's journey in three different places, one where they live in Winnipeg or any other major Canadian city for that matter, one where they live in a remote community, and in this case, it would be in Arviat, Nunavut. And then finally, what happens to a nine-year-old girl with drug-resistant epilepsy who grows up in rural Kenya? In Winnipeg or a major Canadian city in North America, they'd be seen in the epilepsy clinic. They'd get an MRI relatively quickly to look for an obvious cause and then be admitted for video EEG monitoring, as I've discussed in the workup of epilepsy. In this particular case, this patient, who is a real patient, after an extensive workup, the epilepsy team decided that she would be a good candidate for vagal nerve stimulation. And we were able to insert that stimulator within six weeks of the decision to treat. And within six months, the frequency and intensity of her seizures improved significantly. She went from having 30 seizures a day down to only one or two. And although I'd like to tell you that's what happens to every child we put a VNS in, the reality is she was one of our better outcome patients. So the best we often hope for is a reduction in about 50% of, of seizures, but this child did remarkably well. But there are still barriers to access to innovative therapy in Canada, even in a major epilepsy center as exists here in Vancouver and in Winnipeg. So not all provinces have access to approved therapy or diagnostic tools. Even though laser interstitial thermal therapy was invented in Canada, you can only get it in three Canadian provinces, 
And ironically, in Manitoba, where the procedure or the device was invented, we don't yet have access to it. And that's a function of cost um, and also a function of funding of our epilepsy program. But we're not unique in, in Canada. Robotic stereo EEG, which is really now the gold standard to investigate invasively uh, children and adults with drug-resistant epilepsy, is not yet available in every Canadian province. Uh, and although we have funding to buy a robot in Winnipeg, we don't have the funds to actually pay for the upkeep of the robot. And so that's a challenge that we struggle with daily. Focused ultrasound is only available in a couple of provinces, as is MEG, one of the workup diagnostic tools for uh, epilepsy is only available in three provinces. We actually do have it here in British Columbia, but it's extremely difficult to access for our children with epilepsy. In addition to those barriers, even provinces that have these devices, whether it's VNS, DBS, or a epilepsy monitoring unit, how you can access that is, is variable. And so some provinces um, only have, have a cap on the number of these devices that, that they can put in. And we've surveyed uh, epilepsy centers across Canada, and how they fund these devices is quite different depending on the province you're in. In Manitoba, we can theoretically put in as many as patients who need them. Um, but in some provinces, they're capped with uh, only five or 10 devices that they can put in. And if they happen to go through their quota of 10 for the year, you have to wait until the next year until they can get funding for, for you. In addition, um, a huge barrier to care is, is access to an epilepsy monitoring unit. Um, so some centers have more than enough epilepsy monitoring unit beds, some only have a handful. And so there's a large wait list to, to get access to these monitoring systems. So even though we may be willing and able to treat you, sometimes the process of getting to the point where we can decide what the best treatment for you is, takes a, a, quite a long time, sometimes even a number of years. And during that time, you're continuing to have seizures. Finally, within Canada, not all of these devices are available. And responsive neurostimulation, for example, although approved in the United States and Europe, is not yet approved by Health Canada. And the barriers to this are both regulatory and market-driven. The approval process for a new device in Canada is quite cumbersome. And there's two different agencies that you have to go through to get a device approved. One is Health Canada, and the other is something called CADETH, or the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health. And sometimes these processes are parallel, but more often they happen one after the other. And so it may take a number of years before a company actually submits to Health Canada for approval, and that device is actually approved by both Health Canada and CADIS. Some of that approval is market-driven. So some device manufacturers have decided that Canada is just too small a market to jump, jump through those regulatory hurdles and may never actually submit to Health Canada for approval uh, or take their time doing it. So do we have any solutions for this? I think there are a number of solutions that we can to improve access to these treatments, which are sometimes life altering. One is to enforce the Canada Health Act. So the Canada Health Act says that you should get the same care regardless of where you live in Canada. In practice, that doesn't always happen. One of the other solutions is to create regional centers of excellence. It may be that a small province like Manitoba or Saskatchewan, um, maybe we shouldn't each have an epilepsy surgery program or an epilepsy program. Um, and we could have one for both provinces. And the, the paradigm for this is actually pediatric cardiac surgery, where there's re a regional center in Edmonton that does most of the cardiac surgery for Western Canada and children. We could easily streamline the regulatory process, recognizing that there are reasons why the regulatory process is stringent. We want to make sure that we balance providing the best care we can to patients to ensuring that we're minimizing their risk and making sure that these devices are safe. And I think we need to consider new funding models that ensure that everyone who should have access to a, a device gets it. We could also look at negotiating a national price for these devices rather than the piecemeal province by province and sometimes center by center negotiations that go on. And I'm fond of, of quoting our prime minister who when speaking of COVID said, where you live shouldn't decide whether you live. And I think that also applies for patients with epilepsy. So what happens if you live in a remote part of Canada? And again, this is, these are patients that I deal with on a fairly regular basis. What happens if you live in Arviat, Nunavut, which is located 
um, north of the Manitoba Nunavut border. And I think it's quite interesting that when you search for directions, how can I get from Winnipeg Children's Hospital to Arviat? The first thing that comes up from Google Maps is you can't find a way there. And that's kind of analogous for what actually happens sometimes for some of our patients. So these patients have to travel vast distances to get to a regional center where they can get the proper workup. And there are tremendous challenges that these patients go through. Sometimes access to primary care, just seeing a physician in these communities is difficult. Some don't have a permanent physician and rely on uh, a nursing station where they're staffed by nurses and itinerant physicians who fly in sometimes only uh, once every month or two. As a result, the time from uh, needing to see a physician to getting to see one is quite long. And our, wait, our times from referral to consultation are even longer. Travel is long and diffi difficult. If you can imagine having to travel a thousand kilometers or more to get healthcare and being separated from your family and social supports when this happens, that can be a tremendous challenge, as can the change of environment. So coming from a very small community where you really know everyone in that community to a, a very foreign urban setting uh, can sometimes be very frightening for patients. There's a suspicion and often a suspicion and a lack of confidence in the healthcare system in a major urban center. And some of that is cultural and some of it is based on the experience that some of these patients and families have had in the past. Once we've actually seen that patient, then follow-up can also be a challenge. Having to bring someone down every time they need a test or every time they need a change in their medication or a change in the programming of their device is costly and puts a tremendous strain on families. So for our nine-year-old girl from Arviat with drug-resistant epilepsy, that workup to diagnose them and find out what the best treatment is is likely to take considerably longer. We sometimes get into challenges for who is going to pay for travel, who's going to pay for dev the device itself. In Canada, healthcare is a provincial jurisdiction, um, but in our territories and in our Indigenous populations, it's a federal responsibility. And sometimes we have challenges getting any of those levels of government to actually take responsibility for care. And a result of all of this, a family may decide that they're not going to have what we recommend as the treatment undertaken. So they may decide that all of these barriers make it such that they decide not to have the device, whether it's a vagal nerve stimulation, stimulator or something else inserted, even though that might be the best treatment for the patient. It may not end up being the best decision for that family. So what are some of the solutions we have for this? I think we need to work better at engaging the communities that we service, uh, making sure that they're involved in the decision-making on how best to service them. Some of that can be done through improved access to local primary care and local subspecialty care. And the only way we can do that is through, again, engaging that community. Manitoba and the University of Manitoba, I think do a better job of doing this not a perfect job and there are still lots of challenges, but a better job than some provinces. And uh, we have something called the Angomizan Indigenous Institute of Health and Healing, which is a center based out of the University of Manitoba, but with input from um, remote communities, indigenous elders, indigenous healthcare professionals in helping us make sure that we are able to provide better care to these communities. All levels of government need to do a better job at recognizing their responsibility in the care for these patients. Again, one of the things that we do a little bit better in Winnipeg is, is support, providing a support network for those who are traveling long dis distances. And the picture at the top of the screen is the Kavalik Inuit Center, which is a center located about a five or 10 minute drive from the Winnipeg Health Sciences Center where the Children's Hospital is. And so our patients from Nunavut will also often stay in the Inuit Center where they have access to um, a more welcoming environment than they would if they just stayed in a hotel room, which is where many, many patients who travel from the North end up staying. And finally, I think most importantly, we need to make sure that we enhance and expand efforts to increase representation uh, in our healthcare professions. Um, I think the indigenous community is tremendously underrepresented in medical schools, nursing schools, and all of the allied healthcare professions. And although, many medical schools are taking steps to improve that, we still have a long way to go. Technology can play a role in improving this care and already is. One of the things that COVID has taught us 
is that virtual care may work just as well and in some circumstances better than bringing someone down and seeing them in person. I think we're moving to a circumstance where we'll be able to do uh, some of this testing remotely. So remote EEG where we train um, people in the community how to place the electrodes but can, can record and monitor remotely. Portable imaging, our MRI scanners, which are very expensive, cumbersome devices, uh, are now getting smaller, less expensive, without sacrificing on image quality. And so there may come a time when RVIT has an MRI scan. And then finally, outreach. Um, many of our pediatricians in Manitoba travel to these communities. And in British Columbia, some of our pediatric neurologists travel to the community and provide care within the community. Finally, the devices themselves are improving to the point where you don't need to come back to get your device programmed or reprogrammed. We can pre-program a vagal nerve stimulator, for example, such that rather than have to come back every two weeks to get the setting increased, we can just do that. Um, we can pre-program it so that it happens at a set time. And I do believe we're, setting, we're heading towards a time when we can program these things remotely. So from Vancouver or Winnipeg, um, we'll be able to change the setting on a stimulator, whether it's a VNS, a DBS, or an RNS, um, without having to actually physically be where the patient is. That does bring up some issues regarding privacy and hacking into that device, but I don't think those issues are insurmountable. And the final paradigm that I'll go through is what happens to a nine-year-old girl with drug-resistant epilepsy if they live in Nakuru. So Nakuru, uh, or outside Nakuru, Nakuru is a small town in the Rift Valley of Kenya. Um, it's about two hours from Kajabi, which is the center that I worked at, um, about three hours from Nairobi. So that child will have a very, very different um, workup and a very different outcome, unfortunately. If they're lucky enough to work their way to Kajabi, and they may not be, but if they did work their way there, they would probably get an EEG. They might get a CT and MRI scan. The, there's a CT scanner in Kajabi, but more often than not, it's not working. Um, and so very often we have to send these kids to Nairobi for a scan, which takes time and costs money. If that scan didn't show an obvious cause of their epilepsy, like that first case I showed where the patient had uh, a tuberculoma in the brain, um, then it's likely that they won't get any further investigations and won't get any further intervention. So they're very unlikely to get any, probably impossible that they would get any of these technologies that we have the benefit of being able to provide in North America and a wealthier country. They simply don't have that access. Uh, and so they would stay on their anticonvulsants and hope for the best. And we do know that if a child continues to have seizures, that's gonna have a tremendous impact on their development. Um, there's a, a very uh, significant chance that they may not survive. We do know that children with epilepsy uh, can die either from a seizure or for something called SUDEP, which is, stands for Sudden Unexpected Death in Epilepsy. We're still not quite sure why that happens, but uncontrolled seizures are a life-threatening problem. The challenge in a low and middle income country is much more daunting. So Kenya has 17 neurosurgeons for a population of 55,000. If we use Canada as an analogy with our population of 38 million, we have 300 neurosurgeons. We could probably use more, um, but we're in much better shape than Kenya is. The World Health Organization says the, the ideal number of uh, neurosurgeons is one per 80,000 population. In Kenya, you're looking at one for almost 3 million people. So the likelihood of being able to access neurosurgical care for anything in Kenya is significantly lower than it is here in Canada. The scope of this problem is not confined to neurosurgery and it's daunting. So the global, what's called global surgery has now become on the radar of organizations like the World Health Organization. And the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery commissioned a study back in 2015 that looked at the deficits in surgical care world, worldwide. This is all surgical care, not just neurosurgical care. It's estimated that there are over 5 billion people without access to safe, affordable surgical care. And nine out of 10 people in low and middle income countries have no access to very basic surgical care. This results 
in almost 19,000 unnecessary deaths every year because of a lack of access to essential surgical care. To put that in perspective, that's three times the number of deaths that we see from um, HIV AIDS and malaria. So these are things that we've actually made strides on globally in reducing the um, death rates from, but surgery still has a tremendously long way to go. If you look at major operations and most of neurosurgery, 75% of major surgeries worldwide are performed in the wealthiest one third of countries. Uh, yet another example of the tremendous inequity we have across our world. This is a map put out by um, some neurosurgeons at Duke who have started something called the Duke Neurosurgery Project, which seeks to address these issues worldwide. And this is what the world would look like proportional to the number of neurosurgeons. And so you see the United States is somewhat disproportionate in size. This is Japan. Japan has a um, per capita about three or four times as many neurosurgeons as we have here in Canada. And this is Africa. So if you look at North Africa, it's reasonably well represented by neurosurgeons, but Sub-Saharan Africa um, has really a shameful number of neurosurgeons in terms of being able to provide care. And most of those in Sub-Saharan Africa are actually in South Africa. So again, to give you an example, there are 50,000 neurosurgeons worldwide, 5,000 in the US and Canada, only 500 in Africa, servicing a population of now approaching a billion people. Almost 400 of those 500 are in North Africa. So Sub-Saharan Africa has a tremendous deficit in the number of neurosurgeons. If you look worldwide, only the United States and Canada, Europe and the Western Pacific, which is essentially Japan and China, have what's considered acceptable access to neurosurgical care. This results in over 5 million essential neurosurgical procedures going undone each year for very basic problems in neurosurgery, traumatic brain injury, stroke, hydrocephalus, which is a buildup of fluid in the brain, brain tumors, and epilepsy. Things that in North America would be treated even in a constrained resource environment relatively urgently. Um, most people in low and middle income countries will never have care for any of these conditions. So it's estimated that we need an additional 23,000 neurosurgeons worldwide in order to just begin to address these problems for essential neurosurgical care. We're not talking about the high tech interventions we have for drug resistant epilepsy. So although this task is daunting, I think there are some solutions for it. The main one being human resources. So we need to increase the number of surgeons, nurses, anesthetists, and healthcare professionals that provide care in low and middle income countries, not just for neurosurgery, but for all surgical care. And increase the amount of research we're doing in these countries. The research I think will lead to solutions on how best to address that care. And we need to promote practical and cost-effective innovations. And I'll allude to one of them a little bit later in the treatment of hydrocephalus. I think we also need to shift the paradigm of the missionary surgeon. So me going to Kenya, working there for two or three weeks and treating 40 or 50 uh, children with neurosurgical problems isn't going to fix the neurosurgical deficit in Kenya. There needs to be a homegrown solution where Kenyans are trained to be neurosurgeons and service the population where they live. And I think there has been a paradigm shift in how we look at global surgery, shifting from um, a Western surgeon like myself showing up in a lower middle income country to us helping provide the tools for people in that country to provide care. And one of my colleagues in Toronto, George Ibrahim, who's a pediatric neurosurgeon at the Hospital for Sick Children, and a brilliant epilepsy surgeon and researcher has looked at how we can do this. And George is a very optimistic person. Instead of asking uh, if we should do this, he's trying to look at how we can do it and is taking steps to do this. So he's recommended, obviously have to address that local shortage and maybe we look, need to look at novel ways to do it. Maybe we need to train non-specialists in the basics of epilepsy diagnosis and management. Um, we have to look at better ways to manage a very resource constrained environment and set up regional epilepsy centers. So similar to what I've recommended in Canada, you could set up a regional epilepsy center in Uganda or Kenya and have patients come 
from across um, Eastern Africa to get their care. Um, South Africa is doing this to some extent. And if I'll allude to how hydrocephalus care has done this in a way that has uh, revolutionized the treatment of hydrocephalus. So although this can be somewhat dispiriting and daunting, there are some success stories. And this is a technological success story. Uh, it, it's not related to epilepsy, it's, but it's treated to something that's even more common in low and middle income countries, and that's hydrocephalus, a buildup of fluid in the brain. The most common way we treat this is with something called a shunt, which is a tube that gets inserted into the brain and drains that extra buildup of fluid, usually into the abdomen. On the right is a picture of a shunt mechanism that we use here in North America called a strata valve. It's a very complex valve. We can program it. We can change the setting. We can drain more or less fluid depending on how the patient's doing. But it costs about $2,000. So it's very impractical to suggest that we're going to use that in a low and middle income country. So an Indian neurosurgeon, Dr. Shabra, uh, invented something called the Shabra shunt. And this is what we used in, in Kajabi, Kenya. The advantage of the Shabra shunt is that it costs $35. So as opposed to $2,000, it's a much more reasonable expense. Ironically, it works just as well as our $2,000 shunt. So you could ask the question, why aren't we using it in North America? Another success story is how hydrocephalus has been treated. So through the work of both local and um, North American neurosurgeons, a neurosurgeon in now in Boston named Ben Worf, who worked in Uganda for about 30 years, developed a series of hospitals that are called Cure. And so Cure Hydrocephalus has hospitals in Kajabi, Uganda, and throughout um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and one in the Philippines. And they've revolutionized, revolutionized the treatment of hydrocephalus, moved away from putting in, putting in shunts and doing a procedure that if it works means you don't need a shunt. The best example of success is that now pediatric neurosurgeons in North America go to Uganda to learn how to do this procedure. So it shifted the paradigm of us thinking that we need to bring African neurosurgeons to North America to learn how to do neurosurgery, to us going there to learn how to do a procedure that was pioneered there. And then finally, for epilepsy surgery, there are success stories. So. Um, the gentleman on the left is Dave Stephen. He's an epilepsy surgeon in London, Ontario. And he and his neurology colleague, Jorge Berneo, um, Jorge's from Peru. So over a four year time, they uh, helped develop an epilepsy surgery program in Lima, Peru, staffed by and run by local neurosurgeons and neurologists. So again, shifted that paradigm from the fly-in neurosurgeon who goes in for a couple of weeks does as many procedures as they can and then leaves to a local solution that's long lasting and serves the community in a much better way. So if you go back to my original nine-year-old young girl with epilepsy, is there, will there ever be a time when that nine-year-old girl in Nakuru has access to the same treatment as a patient in Canada? Is that a realistic short-term, medium, or long-term goal? And right now, I don't have the answer to that question. I think today, it's not likely, unless they happen to be a family of means, that they're going to have access to that technology. Um, but I think we have to look at ways that we can go after what we in surgery call low-hanging fruit. Perhaps there are patients with treatable epilepsy, surgically treatable epilepsy, that we can help. Uh, with a local solution. So with that, I'll thank you uh, for your attention. Again, this has been a, a tremendous honor. Thank you to Dr. Illis for inviting me to give this talk. This is a young girl from Arviat. This is a picture I took when I was in the Rift Valley, which is just uh, one of the more beautiful places. And finally, uh, Winnipeg. This is the uh, Canadian Museum for Human Rights, which if you're ever in Winnipeg, I highly recommend. And I'll end with a picture of the Northern Lights from Arviat, one of the beautiful things about Northern Canada. Thank you. Dr. McDonald, thank you so very much. You know, you're, you're, the title of this lecture starts with worlds apart, 
I think the health world is immensely lucky to have you looking at ways to bring the world together, at least the health world. Um, we're very, very fortunate to have you and um, scholars and clinicians like you in the field, uh, in our hospitals, uh, and in our ethics life, um, thinking about these very challenging issues um, and not only wringing, wringing your hands over them, but actually thinking about solutions forward, uh, anticipating problems and um, being positive in your outlook about how to bring better care to children, adults with uh, neurosurgical problems all over the world. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'd like to make some, some further comments and then we'll go into Q&A pretty quickly. Um, one is, you know, you, you brought up um, the issue of yourself going into Kenya or, or uh, wherever and doing 40 or 50 surgeries in a few weeks and then com coming, coming home and perhaps going back and dropping like a bomb again. Um, and, you know, I don't think we should ever understate the impact that you do have on the lives of the people there. But there's no doubt, and we've known not only from neurosurgery, but other fields of medicine, that um, on the ground training is essential, not only for bringing numbers up of people who are skilled to make diagnoses and uh, provide uh, appropriate interventions, but there's also a cultural relevance that's important to uh, individuals who come from the communities um, in which um, in which these patients um, are located, there are issues around language, just language and connectivity and trust that's um, really important. So uh, I, I think we couldn't be more supportive of of, um, of of your view on that and the importance of capacity building. I think, as we would call it in code here in Canada, um, a couple other things is um, I just want to bring to the attention of the audience that. Dr. Jason Randawa, who is a UBC neurology resident, and Dr. Chantel Harasdell, who's an epileptologist at Vancouver General Hospital, uh, wrote a, a beautiful, did a beautiful analysis and wrote a very interesting paper on ethical pathways to triaging patients to epilepsy monitoring units. It came out in the Journal of Medical Ethics uh, last year. And for those of you who are interested in the concept of triage, you can look it up or you can contact us and we'd be very happy to uh, help you find the paper or if someone on my team can very quickly and cleverly put it in the chat box, we'll offer you the link uh, uh, momentarily. Uh, and the other is uh, in shameless self-promotion with uh, you, Dr. McDonald. Uh, we are working on a film documentary called Seizing Hope, High Tech Journeys in Pediatric Pediatric Epilepsy, which we will release uh, in, uh, uh, in early summertime, if not late spring. Um, and it features families who are undergoing decision-making around neurotechnologies, um, what their challenges are, what their hopes are, and um, with the goal of re really bringing these technologies and decision-making to, to the home and to the clinics. And we're really looking forward to releasing that. And for all of you joining us today, we'll be sure that you receive that information. Um, so uh, a few questions. One I'm actually going to um, take right away from uh, Roz Kunin. Thank you so much for joining us, Roz. And it uh, also uh, links a bit with, with my question for you, which is that, can you share with us a little bit about um, what are the causes, for example, of epilepsy or hydrocephalus? And when you remove uh, eloquent, what you called eloquent parts of the brain, uh, is there an impact on other on other functions than just ameliorating the epilepsy or the buildup of fluid in the brain itself? Um, so if we look at causes of epilepsy and hydrocephalus, they actually vary depending on where you're located. So there are countless causes of epilepsy. They can be post-traumatic, sometimes tumors or developmental malformations can cause epilepsy. Um, sometimes we never find a structural cause and that's where invasive monitoring can play a role in, even though we don't find a structural cause, we can find an actual focus of epilepsy and resect it. Um, hydrocephalus, again, very much depends on where you're located. Uh, in Kajabi, for example, the most common cause of hydrocephalus is post-infectious. So a child who gets meningitis that's either, either partially or not treated and then, um, develops hydrocephalus as a result of that. Uh, in, in North America, uh, spina bifida is still a major cause of hydrocephalus. Uh, 
Babies who are born premature uh, have a much higher rate of having hemorrhages in the brain, which can cause hydrocephalus. Uh, tumors can cause hydrocephalus. And in the United States, especially parts of the United States that uh, border with Mexico or have a large uh, population from uh, Central and South America, cystocercosis, which is an infection from a pork tapeworm, is probably the most common cause of epilepsy. Um, the, the brain can be infected and the initial manifestation of that can be seizures. So there are a, a, a number of causes of both those conditions. Your question about what happens when you resect part of the brain is, is an excellent one and, and something that we struggle with when we are deciding how to treat epilepsy. So um, you know, if you look at what we call eloquent parts of the brain, the parts of the brain that are responsible for speech or motor function, then we may be less likely to intervene surgically in those patients where we know that the cost of that intervention, even though it may um, improve their seizures, will be that they're unable to speak or understand what's said to them or lose control over one side of the body. Children, on, on the other hand, however, have tremendous capacity to recover. So one of the operations that's fairly commonly done for, for intractable epilepsy is called the hemispherotomy, where you actually disconnect in the original iteration of the operation, you would remove literally half the brain. Now we, we disconnect it. And so although you're disconnecting that part of the brain and initially in the immediate post-operative period, the child can't move the opposite side of the body, it's remarkable how quickly those children recover and eventually are able to walk again and sometimes um, you know, regain enough function that they can still use their arm and the only thing you may find is that fine movements in the hand are affected. So this speaks to another imperative in that the sooner you treat epilepsy, once you've decided it needs, needs surgical treatment, the better your outcome will be, both in controlling the seizures and also allowing the child to have the best functional recovery they can. But sometimes um, the focus of the epilepsy is in a spot where the, the risk and the, like, the, the consequences of taking that part of the brain out uh, uh, outweigh any benefit you may get from that. But there are very, what we call non-eloquent parts of the brain. So um, you can remove uh, remarkably large parts of the brain with um, very little detectable uh, deficit or long-term consequences in the patient. So the, the right frontal lobe, for example, I'm sure it does something, but most people can get by fine without it. All right, thank you. I am... Um... I've always thought of the right uh, frontal part of the brain as one that allows us to be um, adaptive and compensatory to um, to our experiences as as we go through as we go through life. Um, I just want to acknowledge in this Hollywood squares of this uh, Zoom lecture that we have guests from as far away as Tasmania uh, this afternoon here in in Vancouver. I don't know what time it is in your time zone in Tasmania, John Vienna, but we're delighted to have you and to be able to reach such a global audience, it's really a privilege. Um, but going back to our questions, I wanna ask a question about reversibility. So we're talking in, in many cases and what the examples you've shown today with a nine-year-old girl about uh, children whose brains and bodies are still developing. What, how do you as a physician and as somebody who interacts with families day in and day out, um, weigh the possibility that a condition might reverse itself over, over time versus uh, an ex extremely invasive or, or less invasive uh, intervention. How, how do you, what, what, what's the equation there? Um, yeah, I think the reversibility is a very um, interesting subject. And in the ideal scenario, rather than remove part of the brain, um, it would be nice if we could modulate that part of the brain such that it doesn't no longer causes seizures. Um, I don't think we're at a time yet where that is the best solution. I think we're still in an era where if you have an epileptic focus in the brain that you can resect with relatively few side effects, that's going to give you the greatest likelihood of making a child seizure free. With that said, however, um, many of the devices that we put in are not, um, not destructive, so to speak, but they're, they are modulatory. Vagal nerve stimulation um, over time somehow changes the neurobiology of the brain. And we still don't know actually know exactly how it works, but 
um, somehow reduces your likelihood of having seizures in, in those patients who benefit from it. Similarly, DBS and responsive neurostimulation, they're not, um, they're not as destructive as taking out a part of the brain. Um, for all of these interventions, we, we still don't know perhaps what the long-term consequences in children are. So that's something we're always balancing. So laser interstitial thermal therapy, where you are destroying that part of the brain, you're, you're using a laser probe, but the goal of the intervention is to heat up the focus of epilepsy in the brain and destroy it. Um, we still don't know, are there other long-term consequences that come with that? Are there areas adjacent to the part of the brain that you destroyed that might have an effect, a negative effect 10, 20, 30 years from now? So I think that puts a tremendous re responsibility on us to ensure that we continue to follow these patients so that if uh, an intervention turns out to have greater risk in the long run than, than in the short run, um, that we know that. And the only way to know that is to follow these patients. And I think um, uh, an intervention called stereotactic radio surgery, which is focused radiation to the brain, which did have a period of time where it was being used and being studied, um, we learned fairly quickly that the side effects of that um, outweighed the benefit and it just didn't work very well. So I think all of these things underscore the importance of rigorous follow-up, rigorous and critical um, analysis of our outcomes to make sure that we are doing the right thing for patients. And sometimes these new technologies get adopted uh, quickly, not always with um, the degree of rigor and evidence that, that we should. Sometimes they're studied in adults before they're studied in children. And, and um, I think we are doing a better job, but continue to need to do an even better job at making sure that we minimize risk um, when, when these new technologies do get adopted and make sure that, that we're continuing to follow these patients. Thank you. I'm gonna start taking some questions, some further questions from the Q&A in the chat and uh, interweave, them, interweave them with some of my own. Um, but I think there's one here from Ian Stevens um, that is a good segue from what we've just been talking about in terms of the risks of neurosurgery and the trade-off and invasiveness. And um, he writes, other than thanking you for a wonderful presentation, is um, asks for your opinion that uh, epilepsy surgery is often described as a last resort treatment. Does, uh, do you feel this is true? And does restriction to surgery almost make it a last resort option? So uh, that's a great question. And um, I'll admit by, uh, I'll admit my bias in this. And my bias is that um, epilepsy surgery or uh, uh, surgical interventions for epilepsy should not be a last resort. Um, if you look uh, across the world, um, many of us uh, who, who provide treatment for these patients wish we had seen them further. So there's still a stigma attached to um, neurosurgery in general and epilepsy surgery specifically. Um, and that stigma sometimes comes from not who you would expect. It's not necessarily a stigma that patients or families have, but um, there's, there's been some interesting surveys of neurologists who think of epilepsy surgery as a last resort. Um, and so may wait to refer a patient uh, until such time as um, their seizures are now beyond control and any intervention we have is not as unlikely to cure them of their seizures. So um, although I think you're right, some people think of it as a last resort, those of us who do this, admitting our bias, uh, think that it should not be a last resort. It should be um, considered Im immediately when you're looking at a patient who, whose seizures aren't well controlled on a medication or someone who's having significant side effects from that medication. Medications have long-term consequences as well. And so if I, if I give you a specific example of something called mesial temporal sclerosis, which is probably the ideal scenario for epilepsy surgery. We have the best control rates with surgical resection of the temporal lobe for that condition. That patient should be considered for epilepsy surgery, in my opinion, very early in the day. As soon as you've made that diagnosis of mesial temporal sclerosis, you should at least give that patient the option of having surgery because more likely than not, it will mean that they don't need to continue on anti-seizure medications. Okay. I'm going to continue to invite uh, questions from the audience, but 
there's one that um, I have on my list and it segues very well from uh, Dr. Ken Fung's question about uh, referring, referring the audience to a paper called uh, Acupuncture for Refractory Epilepsy and the Role of the Thalamus. He provides the link in the chat box. Um, but it, sort of, it brings me to a question about uh, non-traditional, non-biomedical interventions for some of these disorders. Um, what, when, when, you, when you practice, whether it's in Manitoba or in Kenya, or you, or you see patients coming from the northernmost uh, areas of our, of our country, um, how many of them have pursued non-biomedical approaches to uh, treatment of epilepsy or hydrocephalus? Um, how many, we know there's a big movement now in treating uh, epilepsy with cannabis. Clearly there's a, uh, some writings around acupuncture. What, what can, you, can you tell us about that intersection in, in maybe it's a, a too wide seeing question, but but what do you see and how do you, how do you uh, work to bring those worlds together? Yeah, I, I think it's a really important question because I think we need to work in parallel, not in opposition to, but in parallel um, to communities that offer more traditional therapies. So I think to discount them out of hand is the wrong approach um, because much of what we do has some basis in, in some of these treatments that go back you know, hundreds of years or millennia. And, you know, acupuncture is a good example of that. The, the vagus nerve actually innervates part of, sen provides sensory innovation to part of your ear, the inner part of your ear. And so there is a paper out there on acupuncture in the ear um, for uh, the treatment of epilepsy, looking at uh, vagal nerve stimulation as, as the paradigm. And, and one of my pediatric neurosurgery and col uh, colleagues in Ottawa actually was working on a, a device. It, it hasn't made it anywhere commercially, but rather than put a stimulator in your ear, it was actually like a hearing aid, an earpiece that stimulated the inner ear uh, in the hopes that that would essentially do the same thing that a VNS would. So that, that's kind of the acupuncture analogy there. Um, in, in, especially in children, I would say that the patients that we encounter with drug-resistant epilepsy, upwards of maybe 50% or more uh, families are using um, cannabis to help treat their epilepsy. And so we work under the assumption that families are going to be seeking out these uh, treatments that I might not understand, um, but I think it's important that, uh, that we as the kind of traditional, or not traditional, but the, uh, the kind of modern medical community don't discount them. Um, because we're gonna turn a lot of patients away if the first thing we say is, you made a mistake by doing this. Um, you know, we, we have to work with patients and the communities to say that, well, maybe we can do this together. And I think most pediatric epilepsy centers now recognize this and, and I hope are working better with, with communities and more traditional forms of treatment. Yeah, nice. in, in Kenya, for example, it would be uncommon for any of the patients that we treated to not have already seen a, a, a local traditional healer um, such that sometimes they came with, you know, cupping marks and things like that, where the family, the family tried that first before then seeking out, um, you know, what we used to call Western medicine. Thank you. Uh, John Vienna, you have your hand up and others, please feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the chat box, but we'll go over to you, John. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Ronald, for this presentation and your ethics Canada for organizing this. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, how is how are these equity considerations actually accounted for in actual newer innovation? For instance, you know, when we um decide which on um, how complex the surgical requirements for the technologies are, but also on what forms of technologies do we focus to develop on, whether we develop pharmaceuticals, um, electroceuticals, or surgical techniques. Thank you. Yeah, an, an excellent question, and and this is um. This is a difficult balance to get because at the end of the day, a pharmaceutical company and a device manufacturer, um, although I, maybe I'm naive, but I do like to think their goal is to help patients. Um, they're also not in it for free. Um, and so pharmaceutical companies and device manufacturers are going to tend to develop things that they think are going to have a, a broad market. And sometimes, um, you know, in the rare disease community that, that creates these so-called orphan diseases that nobody's working on solutions for. I think 
the Brain Initiative, which is a National Institutes of Health funded, um, you know, multi-billion dollar research program in the United States, um, tried to kickstart this and I think has been successful in, in creating a number of, of new technologies that started out not necessarily um, in a way that it was immediately going to be a marketable technology. So I think there is a role for both industry and government and philanthropic funding to help develop these things, especially for less common conditions. So, you know, a pharmaceutical company will always look at something that, that treats high blood pressure or high cholesterol, because, you know, once you reach a certain age, every, almost everyone's going to have that. So the market's huge, but we are going to need to rely on industry, academia, and governmental funding to work on these devices or try to develop innovative devices for populations that aren't necessarily going to lead to a giant market that makes a company a lot of money. Um, do you want to, um, I, I'm just gonna do a follow on question there. When we're talking about device companies. You and I have studied a little bit about uh, the presence of device companies in the, the immediate world of patients and their families knocking on doors, being in waiting rooms and clinics. Do you wanna make a quick comment on that before we go on to a couple other questions? Yeah, and um, so, you know, like pharmaceutical companies, most device manufacturers have um, local representatives who work uh, with their physicians. So they, they can be a tremendous resource. Um, if you look at laser interstitial thermal therapy, for example, um, it's such a physics driven um, intervention that I, I actually can't do that procedure without the um, without someone from the manufacturer being there to help guide us through the process. Um, so, so they can play a critical role, but conversely, we have to be very, very careful um, that we're not putting ourselves in a conflict of interest situation where we're being swayed by undue influence, so to speak. So, um, you know, Many of you may have heard of, of you know, physician payments from device manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies. Um, that's a clear conflict of interest. Uh, and um, you know, sometimes even developing a relationship with your device manufacturer, you, you, know, you see them a lot, maybe you now consider them a friend. We have to make sure that that doesn't influence who we consider uh, you know, a good candidate for an intervention. Um, we also need to be sure some, and I don't want to paint everyone with the same brush, um, but some are really pushing their interventions, pushing it for patients who sometimes might not be the best candidate. Uh, sometimes before they're even seen in the epilepsy clinic, um, uh, you know, some, we, ha we have examples of, of families being approached by a device manufacturer uh, about whether their child is a good candidate for this device before they've even seen a, a pediatric neurologist or neurosurgeon with expertise in epilepsy. So it's a very fine line to walk and we always have to be vigilant with it. Yeah, so I just want to um, acknowledge in the chat box, there's a comment from Viria Kahurinko and I believe she was also an author on the paper that we published on this topic. Um, thanks for weighing in, Varika. I'm not gonna get to your question just yet. Um, I wanna tackle a couple more that have come in earlier. Um, and one is from Ashley Lawson, who's part of Neuroethics Canada. Um, and um, I, you know, I we heard from you about the, the hope at the very least that some devices will be remotely programmable. So that's already a big deal um, to reduce the barriers of travel and geographic access and so forth. But tell us a little bit more about what these regional centers of excellence would look like. It sounds to, if I read Ashley's question correctly and to me as well, if we reduce the number of centers of excellence, oh, we're just making it harder, not easier to solve some of the problems that you've raised for us today. Yeah, no, it's certainly the distance issue may be greater. And, and I think we see this in uh, pediatric cardiac surgery. So there used to be pediatric cardi cardiac surgery centers in Winnipeg, Saskatoon. Um, but there is a volume dependency on this. So for some of these interventions, you will get better results in a center that does more of them. Um, and so, you know, it, we saw that clearly in pediatric cardiac surgery that Western Canada now goes to Edmonton and the outcomes are, are just better because they, they do more of them. So that's, that's the one very strong 
argument for regionalization in smaller populations. But I think also that that helps create an infrastructure that may address the other issue, which is, although you're still gonna have to travel, you can help set up an environment where that travel is easier, so to speak, where um, you know the challenges of uh, getting funding for travel, uh, making sure that a family member or more than one family member can travel with a child for their care and creating an environment locally in an urban center that addresses some of the challenges that come from going from a remote community to a big city. So the, the Inuit Center in Winnipeg is a good example of that. Um, Ottawa has a similar one. And Edmonton has done, I think, a really good job of ensuring that um, pediatric cardiac patients, their families are well taken care of while they're there. So it, it fixes some of the problems, but not all of them. But it is unrealistic to um, be able to provide all of the care, certainly locally, um, you know, in, in a remote community. Um, and for very complex conditions, it, it may not be realistic to have 10 different centers across Canada that do the same thing. Right. Um, as a follow on question to that, um, I want to ask you a, about, about insecurities. So we're talking about high technology in very bad brain diseases. In some cases where people are challenged by food and water insecurity, uh, insecurity around domestic violence, uh, presence of um, high rates of addiction and suicide. How, how do we put all these pieces together? Do we just compartmentalize them and say, well, that's one kind of insecurity. And you know, if we put too many of these things in bin, we'll just get frozen uh, in, in, in action. Um, how, how do we, how do we think about um, real life insecurities, not to mention threats to people's geographic borders and so forth that we're all witnessing in this horrible, horrible war. But um, what, what do you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I wish I had an easy solution to all of that. Um, it's something that I, I do struggle with on occasion. You know, should I, should I even be doing this? Should, should neurosurgeons even be a thing? <laughs> um, you know, if we, I, I, had a, a neurosurgical colleague once say, if we had some magic weapon that somehow got rid of every neurosurgeon in, in the world, what would happen to mortality statistics? Would they actually change? Um, and you know, he's being obviously tongue in cheek, but I think um, this underscores the much larger issue of global and local inequity that many of these determinants of health and disease states are very much driven by poverty, by lack of access to the basic necessities of life, um, you know, not just in low and middle income countries, but here in Canada, I think many of the healthcare issues um, in rural and remote communities, but also in urban communities can be traced back to poverty and lack of access to education uh, and social supports. So I don't think we can look at something like drug resistant epilepsy in isolation. You need to look at it as the whole picture because if you're just treating that one problem of a seizure, um, you, you know, you have to treat the entire patient and the family. And I think, you know, we, we saw this in some of the work that, that you and I have done together where although seizure freedom was very important to clinicians, um, it wasn't as important to parents that the quality of life was the important issue for parents. And if, if seizure freedom went along with that, that was great. But even if their child was still having seizures, but their quality of life was better, that was important. So, you know, I, I think if we look at specifically at low and middle income countries, you know, clearly there are other issues that need to be addressed there. And, you know, should we be pumping a lot of money into access to neurotechnology in a low income country right now? Probably not, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be looking at ways in a stepwise fashion to make sure that those children eventually have access to the same care that a child in Canada might. Yeah. So um, thank you for that. Um, we have a, a really critical, I'm gonna say nuts and bolts question from Dr. Julie Robillard, who's um, the faculty director of neuroethics Canada at her Nest Lab at BC Children's Hospital. 
and it's about validating technologies. So um, we don't normally run random control trials, which is the gold standard in these kinds of conditions. So tell us a little bit about models for validating these kinds of technologies, but not only broadly, but also specifically as they apply to the context of um, neurodevelopmental and childhood diseases and disorders. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think we do a great job at validating them. Um, and I think this is one of the things that, that why I'm interested in this and, and my interest in, in new technologies and how they're adopted stemmed from, you know, attending one of our North American pediatric neurosurgery meetings when laser interstitial thermal therapy kind of first started happening. And at that particular meeting, there were six or seven talks on laser interstitial thermal therapy. And, you know, I, I'm being somewhat tongue in cheek, but it seemed like, you know, we were just kind of picking kids who, you know, oh, maybe this will work and putting a laser probe in and heating it up and, and not necessarily doing a good job of um, determining whether or not they were the best candidates for this. If you contrast that with how a new drug, for example, gets approved, you have to do a randomized trial. You have to compare it to either the standard of care or placebo and see whether there's a benefit before it gets approved by Health Canada or the FDA. The threshold to get a device approved um, is, is lower and not nearly as rigorous. Uh, so because of that, I think it behooves those of us uh, in the clinical community to make sure that we're, we're continuing to follow these patients and seeing, are these, are these things actually working? Not just for devices, but any surgical intervention. And probably the best way to do that is through, is through multi-center registries. So to make sure that every child or adult for that matter, who gets a vagal nerve stimulator is entered in a registry that follows them to know um, whether it works or not. Same for laser therapy, for RNS, and again, I, I mentioned my colleague, George Ibrahim in Toronto. He's looking at ways to improve um, how we can determine who's likely to benefit from vagal nerve stimulation. Right now, we don't have a good way of predicting who's gonna benefit. We put it in and about half of patients have, have no benefit. So we're looking at, at ways before we insert through um, something called MRI connectomics, is there a way we can kind of um, narrow down the number of patients uh, such that we're we're only putting these devices in in patients who are likely to benefit, rather than really what is a coin flip right now. Uh, give us a thumbnail sketch of what MRI connectomics gives you. Oh, I'm not nearly as smart as George, so that George would be a better question to ask. But it essentially looks at um, different things like the resting states of the brain and allows you to look at rather than a um, uh, a kind of functional or lobe-based anatomic part of the brain, a much more functional connected part of the brain and how different parts of the brain are connected. Um, and he has come up with a predictive model that he's now testing um, based on these resting state um, resting states on who might be more likely to benefit. So, but that's a very rudimentary explanation because my understanding of it is quite rudimentary. I think we've seen a similar similar work in the domain of um, of Alzheimer's disease, where co the connectomics, uh, whether it's by MRI or by PET, for example, show distinctions in resting state activity between people who are at risk uh, for Alzheimer's disease and those who aren't. And um, so it's a very powerful technique, in, indeed. Um, we're coming down to the end of the time, but I do want to ask uh, a question on behalf of Eureka Harinko, one of our PhD students in Dr. Robiar's lab. Um, tell us a little bit about the role of Health Canada and um, how, what, how we can work better with Health Canada to bring to reality some of the solutions that you shared with us today. Yeah, that, that's a challenge. Um... There's some ways, if, if we compare Health Canada with the American equivalent, which is the Food and Drug Administration, there are some things that I think we do better in Canada if from a regulatory perspective. Some things are a little bit more streamlined and some are not. Some, in some ways, the FDA does a better job. Some of that is a scale issue. So the US population is roughly 10 times ours. Um, and as, as a result, the FDA is 10 times bigger than Health Canada. So one of the things that, that I've, learned is that um, there isn't the same degree of specificity in Health Canada uh, 
uh, for who looks at the approval process. Um, so you may get someone who's not necessarily an expert on devices, for example, who's looking at the approval. Um, and I, I think it, it certainly would benefit from having someone with some expertise in, in um, innovative devices. Um, the, the bureaucracy is, is very cumbersome and the parallel process that I alluded to, or not the parallel, sometimes the sequential process of um, Health Canada and then this other board called Cadith, which looks at cost effectiveness and recommends a price for both devices and pharmaceuticals, um, adds a whole other layer of bureaucracy. And um, pharmaceuticals have even yet a third layer. So, you know, sometimes it'll take, um, for rare diseases, it'll take six, seven, eight years for a drug from the time of application to actual, not necessarily approval, but having that drug in the hands of people who will benefit from it. Devices are a little bit more streamlined. I think um, they, they serve a vital role. We, oversight is critical that we make sure that these are safe devices. Um, I actually think we should get Health Canada involved earlier in the development process, um, but that takes money. Um, and you know, Health Canada isn't swimming in money and a lot of device manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies won't want to give Health Canada money to look at it. So um, that's another thing we need to keep working on. The, the scale I alluded to is there are some drugs that may never, um, might be delayed in getting approval in Canada because the pharmaceutical company just doesn't want to submit because they, they know the hurdles are, are, are bigger than they might be in another jurisdiction. Same for devices. You know, um, as, as we wrap up, I'll, I'll just share with everyone that uh, Canada was at the, at the table at a 2019 meeting in Shanghai uh, hosted by the Office of Economic Cooperation and Development and a number of subsequent meetings hosted by the OECD to develop guidelines for a responsible research and innovation in the neurotechnology space. And Health Canada is looking actively today to... Um, bring those guidelines to Canada and actually, I'm gonna say activate them uh, for uptake in, the, in this country. And I'm really very optimistic for the efforts that are being uh, led there today. I know one of the things that I've recommended to Health Canada, which as you say, is very focused on safety, is to broaden its definitions of safety from just physical safety to really um, much broader concepts that involve cultural safety, quality of life safety, outcome safety. So looking at safety from a much, um, a much bigger lens than where it, it, Health Canada has traditionally focused. And I think that will empower Health Canada and everyone it works with to, um, uh, to do a better job, not only in ensuring safety at its broadest level, but um, empowering those of you on the ground developing technologies and those of us thinking about the ethics of it uh, to really to move ahead in a in a very impactful and constructive ways, I think is, is what I'll say. And the, so the one gonna, thing I would add to that is yeah. in, including patients in those models and in the decision making around that. Um, you know, either adult patients or families, the ones who are impacted by this, because they bring a unique perspective and they understand the concept of proportionality that that safety might mean something different. Uh, to someone who has a life-threatening problem than to someone who has more of a, you know, an, an inconvenience. That is a brilliant ending to a brilliant 90 minutes, Dr. McDonald. Thank you so much for being here with us, for sharing your thoughts and your expertise with us. We're deeply grateful. Happy Brain Awareness Week, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Bye-bye.